as best as we can determine, Paul wrote four letters from prison. We, we know this because in the text, in all four books, Philemon, Colossians, Ephesians, and Philippians, he mentions that he's in chains, physical chains. And, and in Ephesians, for instance, he says, I, Paul, the prisoner of the Lord. By the way, this is beautiful. Uh, I, I didn't ask Kev Kenneth Bay this. Um, I probably should have. But um, Paul the Apostle was physically in chains in jail. Now, to try to clear this up, when did he write these letters? Uh, there are some people that think he wrote two of them when he was in jail in Caesarea, which is... Um, <laughs> his captivity in the book of Acts. Then there's, that's a two-year jail thing where he had Festus and Felix and Agrippa and all that. And um, so he was, he was in, in prison for two years there, the, the Caesarea imprisonment. But then at the end of the book of Acts, all it says is Paul spent two years in Rome under house arrest, but it was a much more lighter prison sentence. He had people coming to visit him. And most people think he would not have had the um, luxury of writing letters to his churches when he was in the Caesarea imprisonment. Secondly, I don't think there's any reason to believe he got two at Caesarea and two in Rome. Most people, and it looks to me that they're right, just the conservative view of the straightforward view of Paul's chronology is that he wrote all four of these letters when he was in Rome at the end of the book of Acts. Most scholars believe he was released after that, although the book of Acts doesn't say so. The book of Acts just ends with Paul being under house arrest in Rome. Because there, there's about five or six other indications that Paul um, went to other places that he wanted to go to, and we'll get to that when we get to the pastoral epistles, uh, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. But um, we're just going to take it for the sake of our class he wrote all four of these epistles really close to each other, maybe even within days of each other. He wrote these letters, and he sent them to Philemon and to Colossians. The reason some people think it's two and two is because Philemon and Colossians are so close to each other because the record seems to indicate that uh, Philemon was a house church leader um, uh, in, his, in his town he was in, in Colossae. And so um, you'll, you'll see as we go on that Colossians, Philemon, and Ephesians really kind of work together here. Um, Philemon is really closely hooked up with Colossians, and Colossians is pretty uh, reminiscent. When you read Ephesians, it looks like you're reading Colossians. If you get to Colossians 3 where it says, Husbands love your wives, wives submit to your husbands, Children, obey your parents. Slaves, obey your masters. It's almost verbatim the exact same phrase between Ephesians 5 and Colossians 3. So we've got things like that. We also have in... Um, I'm just trying to do a general overview here. We also have in the um, letter to Colossians and Ephesians, you have these phrases that kind of come in out of nowhere, and we'll try to tackle them when we get there, but they're... And you've heard these terms before. Words like principalities and powers in Ephesians. Words like um, the heavenlies. Or uh, we are seated together in the heavenly places in Christ. The Greek word is heavenlies. That's mentioned five times in Ephesians. It's not mentioned anywhere else. What was Paul trying to get at in Ephesians and Colossians? There's another really trippy phrase. Uh, and some translations say, the rudiments of the world, this would be Colossians 2, 8 and 20. And then you got in Ephesians where it talks about the elementary principles of the world or the elemental spirits of the universe. And we'll, we'll talk to you about those when we get there. But my point is, oh, oh, and then you have the historical background of what we call the mystery religions. We'll talk about those in a moment. So you have mysteries, mysterion, that's not only in Ephesians and Colossians, it's in 1 Corinthians, it's in several other places. 
But they all seem to be indicating from Ephesians and Colossians, hey, lift up your eyes. We're not just talking about, you know, great is Artemis of the Ephesians and all that's on the physical realm. In the spiritual realm, and this is really big for worldview, you guys, because when we go praying for Saudi Arabia to open up, and some of you are going to places like Oman and Dubai to open up different works, you know there are principalities and powers and perhaps elemental spirits of the universe that are actually spirits. Now, there's different ways of looking at it, but they could be actual spirits. We know from Daniel, and this is where we get into the spiritual warfare stuff, in Daniel, it seems very clear there were territorial spirits. There was the prince of, the, of Persia. There was the prince of Grecia. Uh, and um, seems to be that they had some jurisdiction. Now, we can't go too far with this because we don't have a lot of biblical data. But when you're talking to Ephesians and Colossians, if you go to the end of the books, it's stuff like, yeah, let's love each other. Um, let's, let's do good business dealings. Let's have good families. Uh, let's don't lie to one another. Let's bridle our tongue. You know, practical, practical stuff. But in the first chapters of both Ephesians and Colossians, you have this almost mystical stuff. You have the word mysteries. You have the word principalities, powers, rulers of darkness of this age. You have this phrase, elemental spirits of the universe. Our New Living Translation, I think, says spiritual powers. It's probably as good as anything. But um, so there's this cosmic dimension that is being painted for us by Ephesians and especially Ephesians. Because in Ephesians you have this, we don't wrestle, again taking the athletic metaphor, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle against principalities, powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world, wicked spirits in the heavenlies. Now we're seated in the heavenlies, but there are wicked spirits in the heavenlies. Is it the same heavenlies? You've got to exegete each verse in, in its context. But five times in Ephesians, he talks about the heavenlies, this other realm that's up there. Now, um, there are some Christian communions that poo-poo all this stuff, and they say, ah, the principalities are just systems of evil, like Nazism. Uh, the, the institution of slavery, um, communism, Islam. You know, these, these are all systemic evil. Th this would be like um, uh, the wicked spirits would be your rank and file demons. But then you move up this hierarchical ladder. Now, that's an interpretation. You can do what you like with it. But some people interpret it to be they're just physical, like the Democratic Party. I better throw in the Republican Party as well. Uh, but uh, th these are, 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 are they're receptacles for systemic evil. Like, for instance, um, uh, well, what, what, I don't want to pick on the Muslims, but the ISIS thing, you, you could talk about Nazism. There's a philosophy, a way of thinking in Nazism. You know what Nazism was all about? People with names like Lehmann, with blonde hair and blue eyes, we were fine. And nobody's going to kill us because we're the master race. And we can prove it because of Dr. Mengele's experiments. And what happened in World War II is there was a, a, a philosophy of worldview that said white guys like me, Anglo-Saxons, are better than other people intrinsically. We are chemically better. We are mentally better. We are intellectually better. We are artistically better. And look at all the great uh, composers like... Uh, uh, Wagner and others that Hitler followed to come up with a philosophy. This is why in chapter 2, verse 8 of Colossians, it says, Beware, lest anybody spoil you through philosophy and empty deceit by the elemental spirits of the universe, or spiritual powers, your Bible says. Huh. He links in the same verse philosophies, empty philosophies and spiritual powers. Is it possible, and we got some pretty good data on this because Hitler himself consulted with astrologers and was very much involved in the occult. I read a whole book on the swastika which came over from India and from Hinduism and Hitler was loaded with demons. 
and they went after the Jewish people, they went after the homosexuals, they went after the Catholics, because they said they were the right ones. Now, secular historians look at that and say, well, yeah, we understand it was just a thought pattern, and that's what some liberal Bible scholars would say what a principality is. Most of us would say, no. A principality is much darker than that. There is a cosmic battle going on. And getting back to Drew's question, this is another motivation to go. Because we want to help Jesus win the battle. We are not just, in, well, you know, poor people are out there getting sex trafficked and there's this going on. We want to go help them because we're nice people. No, we're coming against the prince of darkness. That there is a massive cosmic warfare going on in the heavenly places. And the church has been given by God the scepter of righteousness to conquer the principalities and powers and then clean up the spoils. The issue is not leading a demon or casting out a demon here or there. The issue is conquering the principalities and powers. Now, that being said, there are all kinds of wacky books out there that add to the scriptures on how to do spiritual warfare. I think all the guys I've ever heard come into YWAM and teach on this have been really good guys. I would obviously refer you to Dean Sherman's book, Spiritual Warfare for Every Christian. Uh, there's another, there's several other really good books out on the subject. But what I'm saying, and it might sound a little fanatical, but to, if I was in a, a good old, I don't know, I don't want to pick on any denomination, but in, let me say it positively, I don't think anybody here is surprised by what I just said, because you guys have been raised, and we, we talk this kind of stuff in YWAM all the time. This is why we're so big on intercession, because we really believe our prayers are battling the principalities and powers, that we, we really believe that our prayers make a difference. And that there seems to be pounding on the door until we have a breakthrough. And you've got, a, you've got Luke 11 and Luke 18, which talks about the selfish neighbor and the, uh, uh, and the unjust steward. And you've got uh, Daniel praying for three weeks. And you've got 21 days of prayer and fasting. And you have all this kind of data in the Bible. But what I think Colossians and Ephesians do for us is they lift up our eyes. It's not just, oh, golly, Kenneth Bay is in jail for two years. Kenneth Bay is, a, is a, a visual example to us of someone in captivity to the darkness, to the enemy. And praise the Lord, a lot of people prayed and he ended up getting out. Some people don't get out. Some people get martyred. That's the casualties of the warfare. I don't, I don't presume to have all the answers to all the difficult questions like why bad things happen to good people. But one of the reasons that bad things happen to good people is we're in a warfare. Paul the Apostle said something mind-blowing in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And I will have to get my NLT Bible and see what it says. But in my Bible, in my trusty King James Bible, it says that we had the sentence of death in ourselves. In other words, somebody sentenced us to die. But through your prayers... We were released from the death sentence. It's a fast... Now, what would happen if the people wouldn't have been praying? Maybe the sentence of death could be carried out. Am, am I being too Arminian here? Uh, not, not, not sovereignty enough for you? But let's look at what it says. All right. Um, oh, that's first, first Corinthians. I'm sorry. Okay, Paul's talking about his troubles that we looked at yesterday. Um, and then he says, um, In fact, we expected to die. Oh, here we go. He's talking about trials. You know, like cokey frogs out the window, roommates who use up all the hot water, people who are in the line in front of you that take an extra piece of chicken. Uh, you know, these really tough trials we go through. Verse 8. We think you ought to know, dear brothers and sisters, about the troubles we, we apostles, went through in the province of Asia. We were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure. And we thought we would never live through it. So Paul, he's, it was so bad, I was expecting to die at any time. That's what he's saying. Then it says... In fact, we expected to die, but as a result, we stopped relying on ourselves and leaned to learn to rely only on God who raises the dead. 
And he did rescue us from mortal. What's mortal mean? That means it's, it's real. It's a mortal danger. He did rescue us from mortal danger and he will rescue us again. And we have placed our confidence in him and he will continue to rescue us. And you are helping us by praying for us. Then many people will give thanks because God has graciously answered so many prayers for our safety. Question, is Paul just beating his gums here? Or is he actually saying, you helped to rescue us by your prayers? What if we wouldn't have prayed? What if Daniel, he's battling, the, the, there's a spiritual warfare going on in the heavenly places between Michael the archangel and the prince of darkness there. What if he would have stopped praying at 19 days? He prayed 21 days and somehow had the breakthrough. So, now, let's look at Kenneth Bay again. I want to guarantee you, I didn't ask Kenneth this question, I want to absolutely guarantee 100% I'm right. I'm right on this. Kenneth Bay is a much more grateful Christian today than he was three years ago. Guaranteed. You know why he's grateful? Because he knows what it's like to work hard labor in a North Korean prison camp for two years. He got out. You know how he got out? And he says it in his book. I got out through the prayers of God's people. Now, praise the Lord for Dennis Rodman <laughs> and anybody else that helped. But uh, there's, no, there's no conclusive evidence that Dennis Rodman helped. But, uh, and I'm sure the Obama government finally tried to help a little bit after a couple of years. But uh, Dennis, I, I mean, Kenneth is a grateful person. And you know what? His family is much more grateful now. And his church is much more grateful now. And what did we do a couple weeks ago when he spoke? We went, thank you, Lord. We've been praying for Kenneth for two years. And an abundance of thanksgivings went up to God. Yeah. And that's what Paul is saying here. I, was, I had the sentence of death. Somebody put a sentence of death out on me. And, and I'm presuming he's talking about the enemy. It was a sentence of death on me. I thought I was going to die. I gave up all hope. But then the God who raises the dead encouraged me and then I got out and then he makes two references to the prayers of the saints that helped to rescue him. So may I make an impassioned plea for you guys. Let's don't give up. And like I said the other day, old Lou Engel, he got up and said, gosh, everything's gotten worse ever since we started praying heavily for America. Well, that's okay. I guess the, the storm comes before the sunshine. But uh, let's keep on praying and recognize you talk about YWAM DNA. Outside of hearing the voice of God, there's probably nothing that is more foundational to who YWAM is than intercessory prayer. Yeah. And I've got, uh, it's a funny story, but I somehow ended up with a thousand of Joy Dawson's books. And I'd be willing, I'm, and I'm giving them away to the prayer room. The problem is they're in Honolulu and I got to get them shipped over. But uh, I want to get as many YWAMers as I can to read books on intercession, not just joys, but other books, so that we will be a praying people, because that's how we're finally going to conquer things. And I think Ephesians and Colossians are so good at painting the big picture for us. It's not just, well, prayer is important, and prayer changes things, and I have a little plaque on my wall that says God is good or something. But no, we're involved in this massive, massive battle. And um, when we come back from our break, we will jump into... To, um, Ephesians and Colossians. Since we got about 10 minutes, let me try to see what I can do with old Philemon here um, with, with, his le uh, with the letter that Paul wrote to him. Okay, a little bit of background. The short story is the book of Philemon, shortest, shortest letter that Paul wrote. Um, Paul apparently, well, not only apparently, he led... Um, uh, does it say Philemon or Onesimus to Christ? Um, ba -da -ba 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 anyway, uh, Philemon was the leader of a house church, apparently, um, because he writes to him here in Philemon. Yeah, Onesimus. Um, Verse 10, he says, I appeal to you to show kindness to my child, 
it's, a, it's an endearing term. Onesimus was not a child. He was a friend of Paul's and kind of a spiritual son because he says, I became his father in the faith while here in prison. Apparently, Paul's in prison in Rome, as, as we're indicating from the other three books. And um, what Paul is trying to do here is appealing to Philemon, who's a slave owner. Apparently, Onesimus had run away from his responsibilities as a slave. Maybe he was a backslidden Christian. Maybe he was a Christian that, in a time of weakness, ran away. But probably, when he ran away, he met Paul in Rome, and, Ro and, and Paul led him to Christ. Then Paul knows Philemon, apparently, for his um, connection with the, with the Colossian church, and so he uh, recommends. Now, this is very interesting. Paul had apostolic authority. And he says in verse 8, he's appealing for Onesimus, that's why I'm boldly asking you for a favor. This is so practical. Paul's the apostle. Philemon's a house church leader. Paul could have whooped up on him and say, hey, I'm the apostle Paul. Now take Onesimus back in. He didn't say that. He recognized spheres of authority. There was a local church sphere of authority that had been given to Philemon apparently. There was also a business sphere that Philemon was involved in business with Onesimus as his slave, and the slave had run away. So Paul's trying to get Philemon to forgive Onesimus and to receive him back. And he gives a couple character references on him later. But he says in verse 8, That is why I am boldly asking a favor of you. I could demand it in the name of Christ because it is the right thing to do. Isn't that beautiful? It's the right thing to do. But because of our love, I simply prefer to ask you, consider this a request from me, Paul, an old man, and now also a prisoner for the sake of Jesus Christ. I appeal to you to show kindness to Onesimus. I became his father in prison, etc. Verse 11, Onesimus hasn't been of much use to you in the past, apparently because he wasn't saved, but now he is very useful to both of us I'm sending him back to you, and with him comes my own heart. So Paul's got this beautiful relationship. I've tried to pound this home the last couple of days. Paul was not some apostolic automaton who just wanted to get the job done. He had a, a relationship with people. And he says, he says, Philemon, you and I are friends. And I could beat up on you with my apostolic authority, but I don't want to do that. It's up to you. You have to decide what you're going to do. But may I appeal to you? The guy's repented. He's walking with the Lord. I'm getting ready to send him back to you. He hasn't been useful to you in the past, but he's useful now. Can you just find it in your heart to forgive him? And um, we don't ever know what happened, but we're presuming it did happen uh, for Onesimus' his help. Now, a little bit of background here. We have to get it out of our mind. Most of us, especially Americans, when we hear the word slavery... We think of black men being held up to a tree in the south and being whipped. Uh, we think of um, cotton fields in Georgia and Alabama where people were forced against their own will to work for 12, 13 hours a day and they didn't get any money. And the whole suppression of the African American people and the, the, the horror that was the slave, slavery. Or we could think of William Wilberforce in England and how they would, if you've ever seen the movie Amazing Grace where they took Wilberforce down into the galley of one of the slave ships. And uh, he says, how many people do you think sleep in here? And Wilberforce says, I think packed about 50. He says, 300 people sleep in here. And when they get sick and when they get the, slur the scurvy and uh, we think that they're too sick, we throw them overboard in the middle of the sea. And that's what the slave trade is all about in England. And William, you talk about a principality, and William Wilberforce, as a lone Christian became an advocate for the slaves to change history. Now, how many of you saw the movie Amazing Grace? I, I'd encourage all of you to see it. It's a very good movie. But um, what happened was he had people saying, he had Christians in the legislature saying, William, well, we can't just stop it right now. If we cut the slave trade off, it'll ruin our whole economy. He says, if we do the right thing, 
God will rescue our economy. And so they had this battle and he had tuberculosis. He died three weeks after they passed the legislation to free the slaves. And William Wilberforce was asked like something like his purpose in life. He said, my purpose in life is the reformation of manners. That's just an English way of, an old English way of, help me with this, my English sister here. Um, uh, this um, reformation of manners. That's an old English way of saying changing the way we live or something like that. And he says, and the abolishment of the institution of slavery. William Wilberforce was going for the head. He wasn't satisfied to just have a few slaves released here and there. Let's, let's let them out on the installment plan. No. We want to go after the principality and the power of slavery because it is not the right thing to do from a biblical point of view. And it was, it was let go. So when we see child trafficking slavery today, all of that to paint it in a very dark way, but that's not the kind of slave owner that Philemon was. In those days, it would be more from our perspective, more of a, um, of a job. And there were benefits to the job. If you were a, you're a young family, let's say Dave and Katie here, in a couple of years they have two little kids, Dave wants to provide for the family, and he can go over and work over here for pittance, but if he becomes a slave or a servant to that master, he knows if he stays long enough, he can actually get Roman citizenship. And he can have certain benefits from the Roman citizenship to take care of the rest of his family. Not only that, if he finds a master who's a kind master, like Philemon, or a Christian master, how many of you know Christians had slaves? A lot of people flip out at this today, but we're not talking about the same kind of slavery. We're talking about servanthood. And there were some bad Slaves. I mean I, I mean, I should say there were some bad slave owners, but there were some good slave owners, and throughout Roman, the Roman Empire, there were people who wanted to be a slave and wanted to be owned by somebody else. Do you remember the story back in Deuteronomy 15? And it's a little story, it's from which we get our word bond slave. Paul used that word doulos in all of his epistles. What the bond slave was all about is, okay, you're a slave, and uh, say the year of Jubilee rolls around, and it's the 49th year, and all slaves are to be set free. It's the year of Jubilee, the year of freedom. Ba -da 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 -da, the trumpet sounds, and everybody's free. And some slaves would, you know, run for the hills and get out of there. And, but some slaves, let's say Dave and Katie, who love their master, Dave goes over and says, you know, I, I, I know I can go, I can be free, but I want to stay with you. I love you. I love the way you're treating my family. You've never done me wrong. I, you don't overwork me. You give me a place to stay. You give a jungle gym for my kids. This is great. How can I stay? And he would put his ear down on the awl and bang, there would be, he would have that nail go through his ear and that would be the signature that he's a slave of this particular guy. So he goes from being a normal slave to being a bond slave. In other words, a voluntary slave. So it's very interesting with that background Paul, almost all of his epistles says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. That's our King James Bibles that like to clean up that word. But the word really is a bond slave, a voluntary slave that wants to be a slave. So let's, let's defend Philemon a little bit here. He says, as a Christian, how could he have slaves? Is he beating them? You know, no, 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 no. Whole different deal. There were bad guys. And uh, of course... If you can be free. And this is why Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, he said, hey, if you can be free, go. But if you're still a slave, you're really free because Christ has set you free. So it all depends on our perspective. Um, so maybe trying to wrap up Philemon here. Um, and this is the connection between Philemon and Colossians. Both Philemon and Colossians were both written by Paul and Timothy. Both of them said that Paul was a prisoner. Both of them mentioned Onesimus and Archippus in both of their letters, apparently. as He said to Onesimus, he's writing to the Colossians, and he said, Onesimus is one of you. So that's how we know that Onesimus was from Colossae. Five out of the six people mentioned in both books, or I should say, five of the six names that are mentioned in both books, Archippus, Onesimus, Paul, Timothy, and one other one, uh, I think it was Epaphras, 
uh, were all mentioned in the book of Philemon as well. So um, beautiful little picture here of a guy putting in a good word for somebody else. Maybe I'll make a little application here. Um, I've been writing books for 25 years now. And when I remember, I wrote my first book, I remember with fear and trembling, I didn't even hardly know Lauren. I said, Lauren, this is a book on evangelism. Could you write me a, a, um, an endorsement or a foreword? So Lauren did. And I said, man, I'm on a roll here. So I went over to see Pastor Chuck Smith, who was the father of the Jesus movement. I said, would you write me a, a foreword? He said, yes. Yeah. So I had forewords from Chuck Smith and Lauren Cunningham in my first book called Bringing Them Back Alive, which was published in 87, I think. And, um, but why did I do that? Because I wanted them in a way to sponsor me. I, I wanted their approval for what I was doing. And so who knows Danny Lehman from YWAM? Nobody knew me. And so they sponsored me. And that's what Paul was doing for Onesimus. He was putting in a good word for him. Um, and I can't tell you the amount of times I've done that. I just did it yesterday for somebody. Who was that? Um, pardon? You did it for us. Oh, I did it for these guys, yeah. You haven't given me all that money yet. No, I'm just kidding. I did it free of charge. I sponsored those guys. I said, I know these guys. Uh, they're good guys and so forth. I think they're worthy of a, of a, um, a scholarship. And the same could be said for, um, oh, who was that? I forget who it was. But I always try to put in a good word for people because I want to be able to sponsor people. And that's part of the heart of God. Doesn't he sponsor us? Doesn't he say, Caleb's one of mine. Hey, devil, you can attack him, but you can't kill him because he belongs to me. That's what he said to Job, about Job. And so now that I'm a little older, now I get to write endorsements for people. And I get to write forewords for people's books. And people care, some people in small little sections of the body of Christ, if Danny Lehman sponsored the guy, then he must be a good guy. Uh, I know what it was. A guy called me yesterday about a guy who got kicked out of another ministry. And... From the guy who kicked him out, he was warning me about the guy. And I, I just said, well, give him my phone number. You want his phone? You know, I said, yeah. I said, maybe we can help him. And I don't know. Maybe the guy's a total rotten apple. But I wanted to use my authority to be able to help him. Paul the Apostle said, I have this apostolic authority. And Philemon, I could tell you what to do. I can jump spheres from my apostolic leadership to your local church leadership into your business leadership with your slave-owning practice and I could tell you what to do. But I want to be like Jesus. I want to appeal to your free will and appeal to your goodness. And you know what? I trust you're going to do the right thing. And, uh, and there's been times when I, I've been counseling people before and just said, you know, if I were you, I would do this. But you got to do what God's telling you to do. Because you never know what God's saying to somebody. You know, and sometimes a married couple will come for counseling, and I don't do much marriage counseling. It's one of the things I'm not called to. But if I get some initial counseling and I see some cold feet on that girl or some cold feet on that guy, I go, if I were you guys, I'd wait and really nail this down. Because once you're married, you're married. Now, you might say, well, I don't feel married. You've got to get your feelings adjusted to the facts. Because once you're married, you're married. <laughs> and so I would give them advice. And every once in a while, I will command somebody to do something, but only if it's 100% slam dunk. If somebody says, I'm going to go. Uh, in fact, I had a guy tell me this one time. He, he was a former YWAM guy. He was still, quote, a Christian. And he called me and he just told me he was going to sleep with this girl while he was married. And I said, I am. And I used to have a lot of authority in this guy's life because he used to be on my base. Now he's out from under my authority. But I still said, bro. I command you, do not do that. You're going to destroy your life. You're going to disobey God. You're going to dishonor God and you're going to wreck your family. You're going to wreck the family of the person you're committing adultery with. Don't do it. I was 100% sure I was in the will of God. But I better be careful when I do that. And Paul apparently was very careful with his apostolic authority. He wasn't going to demand for Philemon to do anything. He says, I'm appealing to you. I'm giving you my sponsorship of the guy. I led him to Christ. I'm his spiritual father. I'm trusting you're going to do the right thing. He's going to benefit you. He gave about five or six reasons why Philemon should forgive the guy and bring him back. But he did it on the basis of relationship. And, and this is something that's so beautiful about YWAM. I know so many YWAM leaders around the world 
And sometimes somebody will say, well, what do you think about this? I go, well, why don't you call Dave Gustafsson in Denver? Why don't you call this guy over in Amsterdam? Uh, call this guy down in Townsville. Oh, uh, what about this guy over in Texas? Oh, how about this guy in Batambang? You know, I, can, I just know all these guys, so it helps me through the basis of the relationship. And I don't do it all the time, but if I feel like I can sponsor somebody and I can, and I can help somebody along, I'll say, um, I don't think it was Dave and Katie. There was somebody else. Because I have a title called the Dean of the College of Christian Ministries, which doesn't mean a lot to most reputable institutions, but, <laughs> but it means a little bit to us in YWAM, but it's a title. And I use that title when I can to exercise authority to serve people. Authority, according to Jesus, is so you might serve. Paul was trying to serve both Onesimus and Philemon. And there's been times when I've used my authority to be able to, um, to, be able to bless somebody who needed, needed some help and needed some encouragement. And so um, um, I just said this to a couple a week ago. There's a young couple getting married on the base here. I said, how's your support? That's usually one of the first questions to ask. I'm, gonna, I'm staying in YWAM for the long haul, Danny. Good, how's your support? And both husband and wife, you're both, you don't have two rupees to rub together. How are you gonna be able to survive in this dog-eat-dog -dog world of raising your own support? Well, we're gonna do this and we're gonna do that. I tell you what, if you want, I'll get YWAM, University of the Nation stationery, and I will send an official letter to all pastors and business people that you run into that you feel comfortable to give it to and I'm going to stand behind you guys because I know it and I am the Dean of the College of Christian Ministries the International Dean of the <laughs> to us it doesn't mean nothing but to the world it does and I want to use that authority to sponsor people and I think that's what we'll get as the main takeaway from Philemon Amen or oh me? Amen. Okay, break time <laughs>